today we're going to talk about differential mass balances. And what do I mean by differential balances? You will see. Okay. What we talked about for the last two class periods, mass balances and momentum balances, were what we sometimes call macroscopic mass balances and you sometimes call integral mass balances or momentum balances because they are balances over some large discrete volume and you integrate over the whole thing to get a balance. A differential balance is a balance done on a differentially small, so an infinitely small volume, which comes out to be the same as a balance done on a single point in space. And what this lets us do is it lets us study flow on a microscopic level. So for example, this is a computational fluid dynamics model of flow inside a pump. And the lines there are streamlines showing the path of the fluid and the color shows the pressure. And this simulation was able to model characteristics of this fluid at a microscopic level if you zoom in on the flow because the simulation is based off of differential mass and momentum balances. So in order to set up the equation for a differential mass balance, we're gonna do something called a shell balance. What that means is we're gonna take this tiny little cube of fluid, a shell, and we're going to do a balance on it. So remember for a mass balance, we have accumulation is equal to input minus output because for a mass balance, there's no generation or destruction of the mass. Mass is conserved. And notice that I am calling the length of the sides of this cube delta x, delta y, and delta z. The first thing we want to do is find the volume of that cube, and that's pretty easy. What's the volume of that cube, somebody? The x, u, y, d, z. The x, u, y, d, z. Okay. And so therefore, the accumulation of the mass here will be d, d, t of rho times delta x, delta y, d, delta z. If we divide by the volume, Okay, we get this, which is, so it just becomes d rho dt is all it becomes, okay? Now though, we're gonna do input and output. So just to take it in the x direction, let's say that flow goes in at u, we use u for the x velocity in this class. So flow goes into that, sort of that face of the cube and it flows out of this one, okay? So what I did is I have density times velocity times area. So for this area, I want to use the area of this face. So that's the area this u velocity is flowing in and out of. So that's delta y delta z. This is rho times v times a. So that's rho times v dot. So that's m dot. OK. And it's in minus out. Now I'm going to divide by the volume. Remember the volume was delta x, delta y, delta z. 
So you get rho times u evaluated at x, so this would be x, minus rho times u evaluated at x plus delta x. What's, all over. what's u here again? A u is the x velocity. So we're using the same notation, which is the notation your book uses. Where x velocity is u, y velocity is v, and z velocity is w. Okay, so that's the input minus the output divided by the volume to get sort of the specific thing. Um, and what does this look like to us? It should look like I the fundamental theorem of something. Yes, KK? A differential. <laughs> yeah, this looks very close to what we would. The fundamental theorem of calculus is all about setting up a difference like this, and then you take the limit as delta x becomes infinitely small. So that's when that little cube you're talking about turns into one point in space. And when, when that happens, do we treat the, uh, the volume as, or I mean, not the volume, but the, the velocities as becoming basically non-changing along the face? Well, because when that happens, you're, you've shrunk that face down into literally a single point. And at literally a single point, the velocity is what the velocity is at that point. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you would, when you're setting up the balance like this, you do treat it as if the velocity is constant over the face. And then, as I said, you shrink the cube down to an infinitely small point, and so, that is true then. And you can do the same thing in the x and y directions. And what you get out is something called the continuity equation. There's a few things that can be called the continu continuity equations, but if you just hear the, con the continuity equation, this is what it's most likely to be. Here we go. This is a, a differential equation showing the conservation of mass. So everyone understands where all of those came from. Okay, Sarah asks, why is partial derivative used for the accumulation of mass? So this, the equation we're talking about here, okay, or rho, rho could be a function, it could possibly be a function of time x, y, and z are all things it's possible for rho to be a function of. Also possibly other things, pressure, anyway. So um, we're going to be very proper from now on. And if we're talking about a partial derivative, which we are, we will use the little partial derivative symbol. Okay. I'm not confused where dp dt came from. Uh, d rho dt. That is yeah. rho for density. It came from, okay, this is just the accumulation of mass inside this cube, inside this shell. So we said rho times the volume, then we divided by the volume, which is the same thing we did with the other ones. Okay, and we say limit as the volume become, goes to zero becomes infinitely small, volume isn't in there, so it just turns into d rho dt. And in fact, when you look at this, it should remind you a little bit of other things we've talked about, like the material derivative and the Reynolds transport theorem. You have an expression that shows how something is changing in time. And then you have expressions showing how it changes as you, with velocity as you move around. All right. So basically, this function is saying that the accumulation of mass inside mm -hmm. plus the flows of mass is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. It's the cumulative mass, in, mass inside plus the flows of mass in and out equals zero. That is what it is saying. Cool. This can also be written as this. Okay, this is just a mathematical notation that means the same thing I wrote in the first thing. This is the divergence, but 
that's not that important. Okay, Nicholas says, what is the material derivative? Again, the material derivative was the rate of change of some property following a fluid particle. We talked about it week before last or last week, some somewhere around then. Okay. Now, you can write it in Cartesian coordinates like we just worked out. And you can actually do the same thing, the same shell balance thing in cylindrical coordinates. It's a little bit more complex, but you would get this. This is the equation cylindrical coordinates. So you should write both of those down and have them. Does anyone need a review on cylindrical coordinates? I believe we used them earlier in the class. All right. It's going to give you some time to write those guys down. I think while we're writing down, a little review couldn't hurt. OK, fine. So. Cylindrical coordinates are, um, okay, so this is a cylinder, right? So the Z direction goes down along the cylinder. And then if you're looking at it face on like this, the R direction goes out from the center towards the wall. And the theta direction is the angle around here. Okay. And so if we're talking about the three components of the velocity, u z, u r, u theta, u z is the component of the velocity going up and down the cylinder, u r is the component of the velocity going back and forth between that line between the center and the wall of our cylinder, and u theta would be like uh, this comp okay. <laughs> like a sort of component of the velocity going around in the direction of whatever angle we're at. Okay. Right then. Now, this version that I've written down right here, the all of those densities are inside the differential. So that means that this version is valid for compressible flow where density changes. But so far in this class and in much of life, we are concerned with incompressible flow. So what simplification can we make for incompressible flow? Could you then pull the density out of those derivatives? Yes, you can. And if you do that, what can you do? Uh, you could basically just factor it. You could just... Um, I guess. Well, well, let's say first the d rho dt term. What will happen to that? Uh, that would go to zero, and then all the other ones would be multiplied by density. So you could just um, cancel that density everywhere. Yep. All right. That is. All right. So this is the incompressible continuity equation. In come compressible continuity equation. And it tells us, essentially it tells us that the flow in all three directions has to cancel out. And remember when we talked about the integral or macroscopic mass balances, I did a little example problem where you just had you know, you had two streams in and three streams out. And you all know, because of all the classes you've had so far, that all of the streams going out have to equal all the streams going in. If there's no accumulation inside this box, then the streams going out have to equal the streams going in in order for mass to be conserved. This is saying exactly the same thing, except we have shrunk that box down to just one point. All right. So everything that flows into that point has to flow out. 
That is all that is saying. Now there's a few different kinds of problems we can do with this. One of the most important uses of the continuity equation is if you put it together with the differential momentum equation, which is called the Navier-Stokes equation and which we will talk about next week, then you have a set of governing equations that can tell you everything about the velocity and the pressure all through your flow. And so you can do simulations, right? So this is used in computational fluid dynamic simulations like the one I saw you before. But with just this equation, we can do a couple different kinds of problems. So for example, I could give you a velocity field like so, and I can ask you, is this field compressible or incompressible or can it be approximated as incompressible? How do you think you would figure that out? You take the derivative of each of the components and then set them equal to zero. Or then you equal, to equal zero when you sum them. Yep. You take the derivative, you well, you fig you take d u dx and d v dy and dw dz, which for this two-dimensional flow which would be zero. And you figure out what those are and see if you can add them together and it becomes zero. So see whether it satisfies the continuity equation. So go ahead and do that. Those are fairly straightforward. All right. I want to give everyone the chance to do it. So let's not say immediately when you have it. Let's just wait like 20 seconds, something like that. Alrighty, so will someone tell me what they got for dv, dx, du, dx, sorry. 0.8. Oh, 0.8. And what did you get for dv, dy? Negative 0.8. Negative 0.8. So, dv, dx, plus dv, or du, sorry. Keep saying that, dv dy is equal to 0.8 minus uh, 0.8 is equal to zero. So this satisfies the incompressible continuity equation. And this flow can be approximated as incompressible. And so does not change. So does that mean it is incompressible or can just be approximated as being incompressible? Essentially, whenever we say anything is incompressible, we mean it can be approximated as incompressible. Okay, wait, sorry, let me rephrase that. It's like, is any fluid that satisfies this relationship incompressible? Yes, any fluid that satisfies this relationship you can fairly call it incompressible. I'm not going to just, as I said, when we call things incompressible, what we sort of mean is that it's incompressible enough. But yes, you, you could say that about flows that satisfy this relationship. All right. Dr. Nixon, are we yeah. still able to just assume that the d rho dt term is, is just, um, zero in this case, because it seems like we're just not even checking that condition. Um, that's a good point. Uh, yes, we're, it will satisfy that, well, there's no, 
All right, that's a good point. We're assuming the d rho dt term is zero. Okay, cool. Cool. All righty, so that's one kind of problem you can have. Pretty simple one. There's other ones you could do. For example, on the homework, there's one where you will ask, be asked to find, um, so it will give you the X and Y component of a velocity field. And it says, for what conditions of the Z component will this flow be incompressible? But it's very similar. Now, a slightly more mathematically complicated thing we could do is, Let's say we have, in this case, it's a two-dimensional flow. You know what the x component u is. You don't know what the y component is. And we are going to figure out an expression for the y component. All right. I have a question about this. Yes. So um, I see kind of the, the math gymnastics that we're doing. Mm -hmm. But as far as like understanding how the flow the flow field mm -hmm. affects if something's incompressible or not i'm really not really picking that up so all right so it's if something is incompressible which means that the density of it does not change then because of the conservation of maths the flow field has to satisfy this okay and if it does satisfy this then it is basically incompressible. If it does satisfy this, this means the density can't be changing enough to be significant. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is we know the x component of a flow field. We're going to find the y component. We are told it's incompressible. So we are told it satisfies um, and so we're going to do this. We're going to do some things which you have done in the math classes you have in your multivariable calculus class specifically. But I know for some of you that was like three years ago. So we are, let's see how we do. All righty. So we can figure out what du dx is, right? That, that's the easy part. I'm going to call on a random person to tell me what du dx is. Let's see. Carter, Carter Johnson. Hey. How are you? I'm well. What's du dx, Carter? So du dx is going to be. Oh, Here, it's, yeah, it's going to be um, just a. Just a. Yep. Okay. So, All right, Dr. Nickerson. Uh huh. So, can I can I clarify something? Yeah. Um, so, the reason why we use partial derivative symbols, even though there's only in this case it you only depends on x, is because you also might depend on t in other okay. cases. Okay. U happens to only U happens to only depend on x in this case, but uh, v could depend on x or y. We don't know. And I'm just going to use the form of the continuity equation that's valid no matter what. So um, right, you okay. could have depended on y here, and we'd be doing the same thing. OK. OK. Oh, OK. So u dx. And we can plug. So from the continuity equation, we get db dy is equal to negative u dx is 
is equal to negative a. Hey, I, Ethan, Ethan Saxe. Hi. Hi, if I integrate both sides here, a is a constant, so I can put the integral right that, what do I get? And I warn you, there is a, I wouldn't call it a trick, but there's something you need to remember. Okay, so on the left side, are we just gonna keep that as V on the left side? Is that what you're yep. Okay, so V equals, uh, obviously negative A, um, and let me think the trick, so negative A, and that y is in terms of u, correct? Uh, no, that y is not in terms of u. Y is not, y. Okay. So. <laughs> I think I may have scared you by saying there was a little trick to it. So I, mean, I was going to say just that. What would you say? I mean, I was just going to say negative a y. Negative a y. All right. The what I was referring to is you're right. It is negative a y. But then you have to remember the integration constant. And since this is a multivariable problem, the constant could oh, be a yeah. function okay. of x. OK. Like so. There you go. All right. And so that is our answer. And then so then the velocity field is going to be some it's u and b, and it will be uh, ax plus b i hat plus negative a y plus some function of x that we don't know, j hat. And then we would have to do something else. We would need more information to figure out what that function of x is. As it is right here, we can't tell. Why is the integration constant f of x? Because the constant, remember this is a multivariable calculus problem. So let us pretend that f of x is, um, let's pretend it's like 2x. So let's say that b is negative ay plus 2x. And then you took the derivative of b with respect to y, you would just treat x as a constant here and it would just become negative a. So we can't tell whether that integration constant has x in it or not. That is why we put it as function of x. It is some function of x. Incidentally, if it's a constant, that's still technically a function, any, or it could be phrased as a function. That is why that is there. OK, so with a two-dimensional one like that, it is pretty it is fairly straightforward. On your homework, you're gonna do a three-dimensional one where it is possibly a little bit more complicated. Do we actually finish early this time? So does anyone have any questions for once? I always say I'm gonna to try to finish early and we never do. So does anyone have any questions about this or about anything from before. Could you like a very, oh, this is a very probably insignificant question, but are we allowed to write the vector field with like the brackets instead of I, I hat, J hat? Yeah, you can do that, that's fine. I, I don't care what, use some kind of standard vector notation. Don't make up your own, but okay. I'm, I just always, I try to use the same notation as your, your book just for straightforwardness reasons. Sometimes I forget, like sometimes there's some notation that I prefer and I just use that. But in general, I try to use the same notation for things as your book. That's why I'm using this, but you could use brackets or whatever. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter Cook says, what are examples of compressible flow? And Grant says, gas at high speeds. That is like the big example that always comes up because we're going to talk about compressible flow in a little while. Essentially, the higher speed a flow is going, the higher 
pressure changes you get, right? So like an airplane, it's flying at a bajillion miles per hour. There's really big pressure changes. There's really big, which means really big, significant density changes. Okay? That is why the Mach number, you know, you, you all know the Mach number, right? As in people say Mach one, Mach whatever. Okay. Yes. So the Mach number is, we say that at Mach numbers of around, I think 0.3 is what I think off the top of my head, we start to consider flow to be compressible. Okay. And compressible flow around outer planes causes all kinds of things. So you have to consider it for when you're trying to figure out what's happening in flow going through an airplane engine, for example. And it is also why shock waves happen and it is why when a plane breaks this sound barrier, it makes a giant clap and a shock wave. That is a consequence of compressible flow. As I said, we'll talk about it. So really fast flows of gases. And then also really big pressure differences of gases. So let's say you have like a tank and it's really highly pressurized with a gas inside, you know, um, uh, 20 atmospheres, something. Okay. And then you open valve out of the tank and that pressure difference from the really highly pressurized tank to the atmospheric pressure outside can be so big that it will start to compress the gas and you'll get compressible flow through there. Uh, natural gas pipelines are a bajillion T miles long. They are so long that what happens over a length of fluid throwing through, flowing through a pipe? Pressure loss. Pressure loss. So if it, the pipe is miles and miles and miles long, you can get enough pressure loss that the gas starts to be compressible. So in natural gas pipelines, there's compressible flow. Um, just lots of other situations where you have uh, really big pressure changes. You ever, so when you were a kid, did your parents ever take you to the bank and there is that plastic tube thingy and you put your checks or whatever in the little container and you put it in the plastic tube thingy and it goes over that. Okay. All right, well, I remember that. That is an example of <laughs> using very highly pressurized com compressed gas to transport things. And then industry does that too. There are, you can transport things like powders with that and there's usually compressible flow in there as well. So anywhere where there's really big pressure change is the short answer to that. Professor, I was a little confused on how we derived the continuity equation still. Um, just, do we just divide by volume? Volume just because that's what works, you so, know, or like, oh, is well, there a bigger reason behind doing that? Right. We're dividing by volume because um, when we're conserving this, this is about the, cons the, the conservation of mass, right? So we're going to find the mass in that volume, and then that volume is going to go to zero, right? So Basically what this says, this is the mass inside of that volume when that volume shrinks to zero. So what we're actually finding is the mass per that volume. That's why we divide by the volume and then the volume shrinks down. Uh, okay, that, that makes sense actually. And you, as I said, you can do shell balances and all sorts of for all kinds of balances, and you can do it in different coordinates. Dr. Nicholson? Yes. On that, on that Cartesian coordinates equation right there, I'm just trying to make sure that I understand the d rho dt term. Uh -huh. um, how I, as I currently understand it, I may be wrong in this, I just want to double check, but um, it's 
kind of like you were saying in like 273, we learned about a reactor that had a flow rate into a set volume mm -hmm. and a flow rate out. In order for there to be no accumulation, the flow in had to equal the flow out, yes. right? That density term is when the flows are not equal and there's some sort of accumulation. And I guess the relative density, meaning the amount of stuff per set mm -hmm. volume is yes. larger. Exactly. Okay. And remember, this is differential, so it's on one point. So if yeah. you have this one point and more stuff flows in than flows out, then the density at that point has to go up. Because that's the only way you can store the mass in the same mm -hmm. quote unquote mm -hmm. volume, yes. right? Even though it's a point. Exactly. And so if that's happening, in density would need to be a function of time, but it could also be a function of x, y, and z. Like you could have rho is equal to uh, 2x plus 3y plus 7t or something like that. Sure. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. So then like the equation would be able to pick up on where rho is changing by you just evaluate it at that point. Yep. You evaluate it at all the different points. Right. Yeah. So if if you had an equation like this, for example, and you wanted to know what the density was at um, x equals one, y equals one, it would be two plus three plus seven times whatever your time is, you would have had to define your time. So yes. Right. So this would give you the density at every point with time. And so the reason why the D rho D T term only exists in, in com if for compressible flow is that you literally can't add more mass into the same unit volume if the flow is incompressible. Yes, exactly. Because unlike with the with the integral balances, we could have accumulation in like in the example problem we did, it was the water in a tank, right? And the level of the water could go up or down. But now we're talking about an infinitely small point. So you literally can't have accumulation here unless the density is changing. Mm, yeah. Because the, there's no control volume that can get bigger or smaller. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I see Peter you asked again about dividing by the volume did I already answer you or do you want another just another quick explanation I did I didn't pick it up that time around okay so we'll just go over that real quick so essentially what this is saying is we're gonna look at the mass inside that volume this volume that I've drawn when that volume shrinks down infinitely small so that's what we're doing the balance on is the mass inside the volume. So we take the total mass inside, the total mass there, divide it by the volume, and that gets us, this is the mass per that volume, then we shrink the volume down to nothing. That is why you divide by the volume because that's why the, the shrinking the volume down to nothing does something for us because we are saying the mass inside that volume when it's shrunk down to just a point. Okay, I think I got it, cool. thank you. All right, that was wonderful. I actually, that was kind of nice. Oh, uh, another reason Dr. Nickerson is uh -huh. that if you didn't divide by volume, it would be a lot harder to get like the limit as X, appro X delta X alone approaches something, oh, right? Like, yeah, it well, would be, it would when we it. say the limit as delta X approaches zero, delta X and delta Y and delta Z are all approaching zero is what's right. happening. So when we're doing it in the X direction, we just we just did that part, but they're all I mean, approaching like it, zero because the volume is going down to a point. I get, but if we don't divide by volume, it's harder to get this nice little um, thing that you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, right? so I won't say that it being harder isn't the reason you do or don't do it, but this does come out to be a very convenient way to do it. And you divide by volume for the same reason, though, is because you are finding the change of mass inside that volume. And okay. <laughs> And 
And then you're finding the limit as the volume goes to zero, but since we divided by the volume and got, I guess, the specific mass per volume, we can just do it this way and just look at the x direction by itself. So I guess that's saying you were right. We get the mass per volume because if you, we weren't doing that, what we, we would be doing is doing a balance on, on what? On all of the mass? On a quantum of mass? What even would we be doing the balance on if we didn't divide it by the volume, you know? So since we have time and since the momentum balance homework that we just did was probably tricky in some ways for you compared to some of our other homeworks, do we have any questions about that in our last eight minutes? Yes, I have questions about that. All right, let's do that. Um, so the thing that's confusing me the most about these momentum balances is the direction of knowing what the okay. force of the reaction is and like, what that means all right. and it's really confusing me okay all right and i think maybe when we did class on wednesday i really wanted to get through multiple examples and so i could have maybe skimmed over talking about that for a little bit okay so let's think of the first example that we did which was it was an elbow that is changing the direction of the flow like this, right? So the flow is going out and out. So if we think about this logically, so we, if we think about this logically, intuitively, the flow flows from going to the right in the positive horizontal direction to going sort of up like this. So intuitively, what must the force of the elbow on the water be? What direction must that point? To be honest, it's not very intuitive to me, but I think I'm trying to think of it. <laughs> okay. Um, We're, so we have something that's going to the left. Now it's going up like this. What direction do you need to push on something going like this in order to make it go or to bend it that way? I mean, I feel like you'd have to push it up this way because I feel like it's going to want to go yeah. down. Well, yeah, so you do need to push it up. But if you pushed it up and to the right, it's already going all the way to the right. See, it's kind of going to the left now. It's going up and a little bit to the left. So if, if the forces of the elbow on the water, and especially if it's the only um, F of elbow on water, right? Okay. Now it might not be exactly, because there could also be a pressure force that's also con uh, contributing to this change, but in general, if see the, the momentum goes from being all the way over to the right like that to being like this, which means to the right, but less so and up. And so it must have been pushed to the left and up. And then that means that the force of the water on the elbow is going this way. In fact, actually, maybe let's back down from elbows and just think of a, uh, let's just think, here's you, there you are. And here is a hose, like let's say, you know how they use hoses for crowd controls? Okay, so some cop is blasting you with the hose. All right, 
and, and you're standing your ground, you feel, what do you feel? What force do you feel? What direction do you feel that force? I'm getting pushed back. This you're one getting is pushed intuitive. back. So we know that the force of water on you must be pushing this way, okay? The force of you on the water then, which is equal and opposite, must be pushing this way. And this also makes sense because if you stand your ground and don't get pushed back and so the water doesn't go through you, you are changing the momentum of that water. It is going from, um, you start with an X momentum that is positive in the right direction over here. And then when it gets to you, it splash, it's no longer going to the right there. And so you have an X momentum of zero. So we went from having a positive X momentum to no X momentum. So you had to put a force on it in the negative direction, which you did, right? You did that going to the left. Now, let's say it, the fact that you stayed there and didn't move means that you or something had to supply some force to hold you in place. Because if you didn't stand your ground, you'd just get pushed back, right? And so that would be, and in this case, with a person, it's a little complicated because the force could be coming from like your muscles and your feet on the ground. Like your feet have to be planted hard on the ground and have friction there. But overall, there will be on you some kind of force, of holding you in place. We call this the reaction force in one example problem. That's the force, force holding you in place. And if you were drawing a, um, if you were doing your force balance, your momentum balance on this problem, the forces of all these ones I've drawn that you would include will depend on the control volume you draw. So for example, you could draw a control volume like this, that's just around the, it's just around the water where it hits you. And if you did that, then, and you sum the forces in the X direction, the only force in the X direction on that water is the force of you on the water, the U force. And that's going to be equal the uh, n dot dx out minus n dot dx in. I'm assuming beta is about equal to one for all of this. Okay. So if I did the control volume like that, that's what it was. Uh, but what if I chose, I'll use a different color. I could choose to do a control volume that includes both me and the water. So now the force of the water on me and the force of me on the water are inside the control volume. They don't cancel out. And so to do a force balance on the overall thing, I would, call, I would say force X is equal to uh, force reaction, that force holding you in place. And that's equal to n dot Vx out minus n dot Vx in, like that. So the, the forces you write down when you do your balance will depend on exactly how you draw that control volume. But those are the general, these are the forces we're talking about. Does that help at all? OK, now I want to go back to this example because I want to bring the pressure force in again for a sec. And <laughs> and the weight that we talked about briefly. Okay. So there's a pressure force here. Mm 
there's a pressure force here. So, um, and then an the example we did, there was also a weight there. And we did the control volume like this. So it went around the outside of the elbow, like so. Okay, and so the force of the water in the elbow and the force in the elbow and water are kind of inside of there. And all we have is, uh, there's some force reaction, Y and force reaction. And these are holding elbow in place. Just like whatever force was making you not move here. And so we did the balance on sort of the whole elbow like that. So included the weight and everything. Mm -hmm. That's how we, that's how we did it. And what we ended up with was something that was going up and to the left because it was that force was essentially equal to the forces that are holding the weight up and also are moving the water up and to the left. Like if there was no weight here, like this. Yeah, if there was no weight here, then we would see that this, we would see that what this reaction force has to do is it has to counteract the force of the water on the elbow. And also it has to counteract the force of the pressure that's going to the right. And so we would guess that it's going up and to the left, which is what we found when we did that example. And so for that example, that means the anchoring force needed to be going up and to the left or did yes. it have to go in the opposite direction? Uh, we found that the anchoring force, so this is the force holding the elbow in place, had to go up and to the left. And as I said, this should make sense because we're talking about the forces on the elbow and the water is gonna be pushing the elbow down and to the right. And also this pressure force is gonna be pushing the elbow to the right. And so that force has to counteract that. So it needs to go up and to the left. Okay. Which, so that's what it is logically, but we also um, found that through the math. So you can find that even if it, you couldn't logically figure out what direction it should be pointing. If you set up your math right, it should tell you because when you solve it, you should, you should get F reacts X as negative. And F reacts Y as positive. So that tells you up and to the left. Wait, so how do we know if we're solving for the force of the water on the elbow or the force of the elbow on the water? In that case, you weren't solving for either of those things. You were solving for the force holding the elbow in place because that's what the question asked you. And that is why, the, and the control volume is drawn on the outside of the elbow. So actually the force of the water in the elbow and force in the elbow and water inside of there cancel out and they're not in there. So what you're finding was the force holding the, this elbow in place. If this elbow was bolted on, that force would be acting on those bolts. Yeah, so in this case, neither. There is a problem on your homework. Let's keep that. Um, insert new slide. All right. In fact, let's talk about that homework problem now. This recording will be posted so everyone can see it. There's a problem where this plate is being held up by a stream of water. Like so, which best way to draw this? Uh, like that. Okay, being held up 
by a stream of water. And you are asked for the force of the water on the plate, I believe, right? Is that what it says? Okay. There are a couple different ways you could draw a control volume here. The one suggested looks like this. <laughs> so it does not, so it does not include the plate. This is just the water. So we're doing a force on that little chunk of the water right there. Now, pressure forces, I, I would assume it's atmospheric pressure all through the stream. And so that means there's atmospheric car pressure wash? everywhere. What, yes? Oh, your car wash? Uh, no, what? I'm going to my grandma's. She said a pocket full of things. And I, need okay. I think that is not talking to me. OK. Uh -huh. So I would say there's no pressure forces. I would just mute it. No net pressure force. Just like when we were doing floors on a wall and we said the atmospheric pressure cancels out. Remember that? Uh, weight is negligible. So there's no weight. Like the weight of that water in that little chunk I drew is negligible. So what is the force acting on this volume I drew? The force of the plate. The force of the plate. FP, the force of the plate on the water. And if I wanted F water, the force of the water on the plate, what would that be? Uh, it'd be just the opposite of that, right? It would just be the opposite of that. Hey, Dr. Nickerson. Yep. In this example, like because like the control volume is so small, we neglect the weight. But how do you know when to neglect the weight? The same way you always know when to neglect the weight, which is you just gotta <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, there's not really a better answer than that, except I will say that um uh Oh, sometimes if you're solving problems in the book, you just neglect it because you have to in order to solve it. But that's not a really good answer for life. Uh, for life, I would say that um, you're trying to do a really small chunk of water here and uh, there are big forces going around. You're specifically, you're trying to find when there's a force big enough to hold up the weight of a plate. So like a, a really thin, slice of water is just probably not going to be very big compared to that. All right. And so in the problems I give you, I usually say, consider the mass to be negligible or something. So that's the answer for when you're doing homework and test problems. As I said, the answer for life is you just got to be, uh, just got to use common sense. Here's one of the examples I suggested you look at in the book. The last one has this sort of big faucet deal and it includes the water, the weight for that. And it sort of makes sense that if you have a big faucet with a, lots of beers and things, there's lots of metal going on there. It makes sense that maybe the weight of that would be significant, uh, especially if you're saying, what force do you need to hold this up? and if you imagine picking it up and it seems like it would be heavy, that's probably going to affect the force required to hold it up. I've got a quick question for you. It's on a different topic, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask it before I forgot. Okay. Um, so could we get both this and last time's uh, slides with annotations? Okay. Uh, I was trying to go through the homework last time and there were a couple slides with information that would have been nice, but it was kind of useless without the annotations. Okay. All right. I will do that. I am 90% so sure I saved the annotations from the last time. The video okay. is also up. Um, yeah, it's just, it takes a really long time to scroll through the video while I'm doing homework. And, I'll put it up. I, I always wish my annotations are neater because I'm just sort of talking to you guys and I write stuff, but I will do that for both of these. And also, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna 
if you would like, I will extend the momentum balance homework to Monday. Just. Well, I've already finished and turned it in. Oh, you it's just it that, yeah, it was just a little more difficult. And like, frankly, I kind of wish that all of these would just come automatically with the annotations after class. All right. Because they're so helpful. Your annotations, like, I know they're not the neatest things, but you should see my notes. <laughs> all right. They're really helpful. I will try to do that from now on. So, awesome. But, uh, Thank I, you. Uh, I think I am going to go ahead with saying I'm extending the homework, though. Sorry if you already did it. You can resubmit as you'd like. I get, um, just because this different, the continuity equation homework is probably going to be pretty easy. And so I feel like maybe you should, you can work on the harder homework over the weekend if you want. So I'm going to do that. All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. We'll upload the annotations. We'll upload the video. Um, cool. Next week, we talk about the Navier-Stokes equation, which you have heard tell of. You've heard whispers through the vine. It's going to be very exciting and it will make you feel like a scientist. So you'll love that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. And I'm going to um now. La, la, la. I always lose the controls. There they are. Um, can I ask?